All right, so this is the last session of myself and Derek Fixtel covering 110.3, the electrical safety program. I don't know about you, but all of these sessions really helped me understand the electrical safety program, very important part for 70E. We're gonna cover uh, K and L. So K is your lockout tagout program and L is auditing. And then finally at the end, stay tuned because Derek Fixtel is gonna talk about the changes that occurred between the 2021 and the 2024 edition of 70E. There are some certain things that were removed from 110.3 that you need to know about. You're gonna wanna stay to the end. Thanks for enjoying and stay and being a part of Shock Week. Enjoy. I'm here with Derek Fixstool. K, we're down to two more. K and L. Thank God there's no M. K and L. Anymore. It's, do we want to talk about the changes, the stuff they moved out of there? We can do that after L. <laughs> <laughs> Just quick. Just quick. It'll, it'll quick. It'll be a quick one. It'll be a quick one. So K, knockout. Knockout. Lockout tagout program. Yes. So that's now, so you have to have that as part of your, remember we're in electrical safety program. So. No. You have to, it can be a part of your electrical safety. It can program. be a part, right? Because if you. You can also reference from your electrical safety program to an established lotto program. So if, let's say I have a document that already There it exists. is. That's two. So it says the electrical yeah. safety program shall include the information required by one of the fo one of the following. A lockout tagout program in accordance with 120.02 or a reference to the employer's lockout tagout program established in accordance with 120.02A. Right. And you were going to say. So I can certainly have an electrical spe specific lockout tagout yep. program. And I can put that in my ESP if I want. That's Nobody's going to harm me for doing that. Yep. It gets a little confusing though to have several different lockout tagout programs in one overall safety plan, global health and safety program, right? Mm -hmm. Even though, I mean, if we look at OSHA, OSHA's got three different lockout tagout yeah, programs, you know, and and so, you know, which one are we supposed to be using, and when are we supposed to be using it? So, make sure that if you're going to reference outside of the ESP, that you reference the right part and. And that doesn't mean that your lotto program doesn't need some work. Yeah. So as you're building this ESP out, you may have to update your lotto program to not be just the lockout, tagout, tryout kind of method. Yeah. Where you hit the start button to see if the machine works. And you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't fire back up, yeah, it's off. Yay. Well, no, we have to test before we touch it. And, That's right. and if it's if it's the right kind of equipment, we have to ground it. And there's a whole bunch of other things that come into the electrical side of the lockout. And that's why yeah. the, the, when we say, I, I you know, I, I've learned, I used to say this, but I was, I've been taught to not say turn it off. It's established an electrically safe work condition because it's a lot more than just turning something off. Absolutely. So it's a process. It de-energize it, make sure it can't come back on and verify it's off before yeah. you touch a thing. Yeah. So you can, you can, and then like you said, in some cases, you may have to put uh, ground straps in. You might. Yeah. So depending upon the equipment. Well, and really when you look into the electrically safe work condition, that grounding piece, mm -hmm. when do we, t when do we ground? Electric that's, that's your medium voltage stuff, right? That's a lot of times it's our medium voltage. Yeah. It's an induced voltage. It's a yeah. stored capacitive charge or, yep. you know, it's to hold it at zero volts because maybe there's energized conductors close by sure. um, that could re-energize the system. But do we typically use a contact meter on those systems? Oh, no. No, what do we use? You use, uh, you, you use uh, proximity. Proximity test. Yeah. Does a proximity tester read zero volts? No, it does not. So what are what are my grounds hanging really telling me? It's not telling you anything. It's just that it's in. What is it telling? What is it that the circuit is at zero volts? That's true. Yeah. Because if my grounds are hanging and the circuit is at right. zero volts, I've got a problem. That's, yeah, yeah, and you'll know yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I see that. I like. That. Wow. 
Yeah, and he just says it, he says it like nonchalantly, like, <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, I, I got all this stuff from watching the 70 e committee. This came up in the committee meeting last time. Wow. I think it was Mr. Wallace was like, no, I think he fought, he fought pretty hard about the proximity testers cannot tell you zero volts. All it can tell discussion. you is a lack of nominal system voltage. Well, I can't even tell you that. No. It can only tell you there's a presence of voltage. Yeah. So a non-reading is just a non-reading. It isn't It isn't a lack of voltage reading. That's exactly right. Yep. I remember that discussion too. But see, he, he got so much more out of it than I did. Oh, I, I bring it up every... Again, these are the <laughs> things I can't sleep over. <sighs> okay, so lockout tagout program is important. Yes. In establishing an electrically safe work condition. And you should have it as part of your plan, either... You include it in accordance with 120.2, or you reference a the employer's lockout takeout program that is established right. in accordance with 120.2. Right. Just make sure your reference program meets electrical standards. Yes. Yeah. So if you just have a one what 1910 147 lockout yeah. tagout, then you're gonna have problems because it doesn't reference the electrical side. That's the that's the interesting part. In 1926 versus 1910. Lockout, they're so different. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then there, well, the, so just in 1910, there's three different lockout tagouts. Yeah. So there's there's 147, which is your general. Right. Subpart S, which is your premises wiring system stuff. Yeah. And 1910, 269, which is your generation, transmission, distribution stuff. And then there's 1926. Jeez, oh, man. You got to really, you got to be a lawyer these days to really know. I mean, it, or a consultant. Ah, <laughs> e hazard. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. So, so I mean, one thing we did. I mean, it's it's hard for us to wrap our heads around this too. So we bring on specialists. So, so like Renee sure. Graves from. I mean, you're familiar with Renee from my yep. electrical safety okay. workshop. Yep. Fantastic work on lockout Tago at when she was with Texas Instruments. Yeah. And and so. Now that she's retired, we get to bring that expertise in house. So that's beautiful. So she is doing all kinds of lockout tagout work for us right now, and that's we're keeping great. her as busy as she is. She can as she wants to be as busy as she wants to be. That's and, right, and, and maybe a little more. And maybe a little more. <laughs> a little more. <laughs> you bend that arm as as far well, as you Renee's can get awesome. It. I mean, you know, well, she Renee, is awesome. Yeah. Renee is just absolutely awesome. So oh, she, she she's one of those folks that just puts her nose to the grindstone and gets it done. She's a worker bee, that's yeah. for sure. All right, lockout tagout program. Anything else? I'm all good. I rest my case. I rest my case. And the last one, the last but not least, that begins with an L, one ten dot three L auditing. Now, uh, <laughs> I know auditing is separated into three, four sections. You've got the electrical safety program audit. You have the field work audit, the lockout tagout program and procedure audit, and then documentation. Now, is this, we talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. We talked about, we talked, where was it? Up above, about not inspection awareness and self-discipline okay in in d and we said you that that so, it says that um the program shall be developed to provide the required self-discipline for all employees who must perform the program shall instill safety principles and controls can the audit be a form of control i think it absolutely is Boom. How, how, i mean how are you gonna how are you gonna measure the success of your program if you are doing regular health check checkups on it, right? That, you're absolutely. It, it, so you're you're doing a check of the the safety program, yeah. The field work, right? right? So these are the gig or guys and gals. So this is, hey, I'm going out to job X Y Z, and I'm going to check, and you're going to walk around. Do they got the proper PPE on? Is he wearing his fall protection? Uh, I love that. There's a thing on either you not you to I think it's on Instagram. Where they have the guy who's got the hat, and he's like supposed to be the OSHA guy. Yeah. He goes, "Oh, this." So, <laughs> so, good. so by the way, that's that that's that app that we shall not name, kind of thing. Is that? Well, but I, they're, they're cross pollinating all the. They're cross, yeah, yeah but, because they're trying but to. Yeah, it's it's like. 
Yeah, yeah. And they show the guy the one. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. They show the guy in a, in a in a front loader sliding down the hill, and he's like, you know, they show they yep. show the event, and they show his face. Yep. So so getting out, watching your people work is important, right? And and it's but it's it's also more than that. So the the written program we're going to review every three years to make sure it's still in compliance with the latest and greatest on set. And that is the yeah one the yep. audit program. So. That's what that's going to do is just make sure that our written program is up to date. Right. Then we need to we need to do a, a regular maintenance checkup on our work procedures. So is that the field work? Audit? That's the field work on it to make sure that our people are doing things the way they're supposed to do. So that is that is one of the major controls. Yeah, we're going to do that on an annual basis to make sure we aren't slipping on stuff. Okay. Now that doesn't mean we have to watch everybody do everything. We don't have to watch uh, annually. We don't have to go sit through um, and watch every single person within our right. company do everything. But it's it's about it's about def it's just like I said. It's a, it's a maintenance checkup on our procedures to yeah. make sure we're doing them the right way and the way they're supposed to be done. Yeah, and you, you and you know it it, it probably would be. I don't know how people implement this, but it would be interesting to say, okay, I have, uh, we're going to have, um, we're going to have a, on this project, they're going to establish electrically safe work condition. Yeah. So it would be interesting to say, hey, I want to be there when they start this and, and look at your own procedures and say, am I missing anything? Watch somebody do it. Oh, yeah. And then, and then it's not that they're doing it wrong. It's that maybe your, procedure for that process is not is missing is, yeah yeah is missing something. so i i do a ton of gap analysis yeah. and so so i mean the whole industry wants to call everything an audit right but to me an audit is yeah. okay i've got a checklist full of things like does it meet section 110.2b check it meets it right but what i'm really more interested in is like let me just sit back and be a fly on the wall right while you do your thing I want you to do your thing the way you normally do it. Yeah. And let's identify gaps in the way we're normally doing work and find, try and find realistic solutions to it. Because if, right. if I just check a box on well, the work you did didn't meet this section, yeah. does that offer any real valid solution coming out of it? And, and, and most, most electrical safety auditors are also trainers. So when they go, when they go check that box, we can't help ourselves but to educate who we're auditing and say, look, this is this is the way it should be done. And and yeah, but but from a third party standpoint, I really think third party should probably be on the gap analysis side instead of the audit side. But an audit should be done. Okay, A, the the employer is auditing the work they're doing in mm -hmm. accordance with their ESP. That's what they're auditing. Right. Okay. The employer or a third party could audit the employer's ESP to 70E or review it to 70E. Yep. Okay. And then a third party could come in and get an overall bigger picture to look at what's what are gaps that we need to shore up. I like and it. how to how to and that helps us with developing electrical safety, like the written programs. Yeah. Helps us with informing, you know, where do we need to go when it comes to lotto programs. Right. Helps us with um, even training needs that we find. And sure. And, yeah. and now the big one entering the conversation is maintenance. So just recently I was down doing an, an well, we, we called it a gap analysis. Okay. But I um, had a client and they had several different factions of their business. And one of them was the part of the business that was the, the it put the majority of the, the coin in the register. Well, it that part of the business had immaculate maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they had maintenance for their maintenance and sure. And then some. Yeah. And, and it was really impressive to see that. But then the other side of the house, which didn't necessarily have a direct tangible measurement to the, the, the bottom dollar or bottom line had absolutely no maintenance program. But the problem is, is that the equipment that the first 
or the, the equipment that the first team used, yeah. which they were doing all this maintenance on, was fed from the other team's equipment. Ooh, oh, wow. So by doing no maintenance yeah. on... So they were just basically, I mean, like, you can yeah, do all the you're only stuff. reliable as your weakest link. Right, right. And so, like, there's a major gap. Oh, yeah. So how do we, now we've identified it. Yeah. What do we do to, what do we do to solve that? Well, yeah. let's start by coming down and doing a full-on, all-out maintenance, condition of maintenance assessment and, and maintenance wow. gap analysis to see yeah. where are you at, like, and it's got, constructive. It's yeah. not right. It's not it's like not not yeah. to beat you up. It's right. not to beat you up. It's like you've got all these big gray boxes that do things. Yeah. If we don't take care of them, they go boom, and people get hurt. That's right. What it is? What or is process it? goes down? Or process goes down? Yeah. yeah. It process goes down, and you lose money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and reality. I mean, companies are not in business right. to just be there. They're they're. They're in they business. They need to make money. So it's in it's in their best interest of the bottom dollar. Yeah. To do the maintenance. See, it's hard sometimes for us to tie safety to the bottom line. Yeah. Because because a lot of times they don't see that direct ROI on it. So a lot of times, I, unless they I, had an event, I, unless they have an event, yeah. or they got somebody on that chain of command that understands that part of it. Yeah. Uh, and I hate bringing money into the safety conversation. You have to, but you have to. Yeah. And and so a lot of people have a hard time connecting the dots on that ROI and, and yep. with safety. But when it comes to maintenance, like I was, maintenance is a that's that's the biggest pork chop softball pitch I've ever gotten in my life. Yeah, to hit a home run on when it comes to selling the stuff. Yeah. Now the the deliverables is a little that's a that's a different question. How deep do we need to go as consultants? Sure. How, sure. How, how much do we need to put into it? Yeah. But I think. Just from a, all right, do you know, it's five o'clock. Do you know where your maintenance is? Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And just to have that conversation <laughs> you know. and, and go in and do the assessment. And I'll, I'll tell you what, what you do is you take 70B and you take the client's or the facility's existing maintenance plan. And you say, okay, I'm going I'm to get your maintenance crew in. Sometimes they farm it out, right? You know, bring them in here, have them look at what they are doing, and then look at 70B, what they're, what the expectation is, the minimum requirements, and then identify the gaps. And you say, do you feel comfortable now with your existing maintenance plan? Not that the, your, the people who are doing the maintenance are not doing the good job. They're doing what they, yeah. what they're supposed to be doing. But is that enough? And then you say, then you look at your maintenance plan, you know, your maintenance personnel, and you say, okay, we need to do an, we need to ascertain the condition of maintenance of all of our key comp, all of our critics, our, our electrical equipment, right? Then you need to prioritize what are what is more important than than others, right? So you may you do the condition, you prioritize, you might say, I have a piece of equipment that is in my main lobby. That's very important because there are individuals, there are customers out there, okay? Right. I might have a piece of equipment that's not in the main lobby, that's out in, in, uh, you know, in its own location, but it's on a critical uh, piece of my production. And if it goes down, I lose millions of dollars a minute, right? right. Or an hour or whatever. Uh, I, I have a direct loss. So that might be critical because of its importance to the process and to the bottom line, something else might be more critical because of its proximity to other workers. And right. maybe, you know, so you have to <coughs> prioritize everything and then establish a plan on how do I bring everything up to the right maintenance level? Because 70E and all that work, safe work practices doesn't mean it's quality if you don't. That's exactly right. And how do you identify that stuff if you don't put the time in yeah. To do the audits and the gap analysis and the reviews that were, yeah, yeah, and that yeah. that so this is one I've been charged with. Like I said, coming up with this electrical maintenance program piece. But how is the electrical maintenance program anything outside of the electrical safety program? It is all yeah. one. Big it's all one big blob. Piece. Yeah, it it's, is. It's another chapter in the overall. Yep, so it, in yeah. the overall safety manual. They're dovetailed right in. You got the NEC, 70E, and 70B. You can't separate those three. Any one of them falls on their face. 
Yep. You lost your safe three-legged stool. It's a three-legged stool. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So you got your lockout tag out, program, which we already talked about. Yeah. You got to audit that. And that could just be, and that's this annually. It says the lockout tag up procedures uh, of 120.236 shall be audited by a qualified person at intervals not exceeding one year. The audit shall cover at least one lockout tag out in progress. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's let's the, go out and watch a lockout tag out. Yeah. Make sure that it A is meeting the procedure as written. But then make sure the procedure is not violating either 70E or any of the lockout tagouts in OSHA, whichever is yeah. the applicable one. But hopefully yeah. it's an electrical one. Yeah. And I've heard that the lockout tagout program of 70E is far better than what's in OSHA. It's far much more, it's more clear. Is that? Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> ah, man. Uh, it's, it, it is very. That the lockout tag up program in 70E can be very confusing if you don't have a solid understanding of what lockout tag because it's not it's not really written in like a yeah. do this, do this, do this, do this. Right, right, right. right it's right. here's a bunch of information, build a lockout tag up program. Yeah, you're right. So what a lot of people miss about 70E, and I think from the it's early onset. We thought 70E was going to be this list of things you do to stay safe. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's more as it matures become this document. And I used to hate when I heard this before as, a, as an electrician. And I'd hear this statement made. I would make my blood boil. It was becoming more of a document to help employers build their electrical safety program. Mm. As opposed to a, a set of, yeah, here's what you do to stay safe from electricity. I mean, it's still the same that's yeah. st that's still what it is, but it's not a step by step guide for the worker so much today as it maybe was in the past. Mm -hmm. And and today now it's becoming more of a you're going to build your stuff. Here's the stuff that's got to be in what you build. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. But again, like I said, if you have a good understanding of lockout tagout on yeah. OSHA then the stuff in 70E does clarify some. It does fill gaps that are... Those gaps. Yeah. And then finally, you need just to document everything. So you do your audits. You document all your audits. You have those as uh, as your evidence that you've done everything that you're supposed to if do. If it isn't documented, what? It never happened. Never happened. It's just like meeting minutes. I tell that to people in my company, if you don't have an agenda, it's not good. Your meeting is going to go everywhere. And if you don't have meeting minutes, meeting never happened. And that's my excuse of not doing any of the action items that occurred during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It never happened. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody took minutes. Nobody took minutes. Nor was Nobody. there agenda. And, you know, all those little action items that, you, that were mentioned during the meeting, yeah. I can't remember. Right. right. Yeah. I love it. Derek, I can't believe it, but we finally finished what I thought wasn't going to be that long. But boy, I didn't think like I had plans for tonight too. Did you? Yeah, <laughs> not not with other people, but like I I had plans like wait, maybe I'll take them out to dinner. Like oh. say thanks for doing this. <laughs> and no, here we are still. Here but, we are. But man, Bob Joe shared it. Fantastic stuffed pepper with me. It was, it was good. That was delicious. Yeah. yeah I had to have one too. I, I, I had them for lunch. We had them around 12 o'clock when I was on a call. I went up, ran upstairs and I ate my pepper. And then, uh, I don't know. I just, I, 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 I complete, I was like, I, th this was such a good session. Usually, if we get into dialogues like this and I'm not hungry, mm -hmm. I'm having a good time. I didn't get hungry. Right. I'm like, oh my god! I'm glad that she said something, right? <laughs> like, man. So, and uh, I do want to talk about a couple things quick before we. Sign oh up. yes, just a couple changes from 21 to 24. There's a, a few sections that have been taken out of what the was safe, in the 20 the safety plan. Uh, yeah the 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 main one I want to talk about is people will notice yeah. that the um the the in 2021 it had a section in there that the ESP had to 
contain a policy on creating an electric and safe work condition. And that is gone now from the 2024 um, section 110.3. Okay. It moved into 110.2a. I say it, yeah. it, they, it's still they there. The importance of it's it. still in 70e. It just moved out of the section. Yeah. So it, it went from 110.3 to 110.2. And wait, not 110.2. No, it was, it was in 110.5 in the 2021. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It was like five, one oh, 110.5. Uh, is it K or L? Or? I'm looking right now. I'm in the 110.5. K was the electrically safe work condition policy. Yep. And they moved so that. So that came out and it got put into 110.2A. Yeah. And that's your policy. So if I'm, if and correct me if, if I'm wrong, if I misstate this, what they were trying to do in the 24 edition was elevate the significance and importance of it correct by putting it in um the electrical electrically safe work condition and they created a first level subdivision a policy yeah. to just say look you need to have this as your policy that you are going to establish an electrically safe work condition. And it is the priority of your electrical it safety. It is the priority, yes. Yeah, and because before you had, it, it would, the section said hazard in, in 110, well, in the, the electrical safety program, mm -hmm. like you said, said you have to have a policy on creation of an electrically safe work condition. And you had a different section that said yes. hazard elimination should be the first priority. Yeah. And the user of 70E had to connect the dots on that. Yeah. Now it says an employer's electrical safety program shall contain a policy on creating an electrically safe work condition, and that shall be the priority of that program. Wasn't there I, something's telling me that they that, that an earlier version? So they flip flopped. They went from like the exception from they went from an exception to positive text, and then back to an exception again, and I. Thought that they did the same thing with the so one ten dot one was the electrical safety program in the twenty eighteen edition. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it was one ten dot one was the electrical safety program. So they had the 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 stress was on the program. Right. And and in there they had the general requirements, you uh, which basically said that you had to have a program that it should be implemented as part of the employer's overall occupational health and safety management system when one exists. Then you had inspection, um, the electrical safety program, the electrical safety controls, procedures. I'm just looking at incident investigation. Then you had auditing. So, no, it didn't have right. establishing an electrically safe work condition as – Correct, but go to I think in that one, go to uh, one twenty dot one. It was in one twenty establishing an electrically safe work condition. Yeah. The employer shall establish, document, and implement a lockout takeout program. The lockout takeout program shall specify blah 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 blah. And they might have moved it into one ten dot three by that. No, up was, in the one ten. Uh, the host employer shall report, observe, nope. host employer. That was host employer contract. So there was a priority statement. There was. In 18. I just don't know where it is. And and, and, and so I, I think what they did over those three cycles what was, five. was oh, oh, the employer shall the following so establish, document, and implement safety-related work practices and procedures, provide employees with training, employee responsibility, Priority, the hazard elimination shall be the first priority in the implementation. So they had it in 105. Correct. And then, so that was in 2018. In 21, was it in 105? Let's just look at 105. No. One, they moved it. They, they moved, moved it to 120 or 110.1. They so. moved it to 110.1, which was the which was priority. And yeah. then in 2024. 110.1 had to be scope yep. because they had to, they, this was they the enforcement the, of the style manual. Style manual. Yep. So 110.2 is where they kept the policy, but they called it the electrically safe work condition. They kept policy as A, so they still have it ranked high. And right. then that's when we went to the exceptions, 
when you can't establish right. an electrical say, work. And, and so, so I might know the guy. Uh, he's got a fantastic haircut that wrote one of the public input that led to the exceptions coming back in. Okay. And, and I, I, or that guy, the submitter wrote his public input in a way that, um, could have been, could have gone either way. Right. Yeah. So in 2021, you had a section on creating an electrically safe work condition. You had section on energized work. Right. And you had nothing tying the two together. So, so in the one section, it said you have to create an electrically safe work condition. If you're in arc flash hazard or you're inside a limited approach boundary. Right? right. The other section what said energized work is permitted when, and there was nothing to say create an electrically safe work condition under these two items unless you meet the requirements in one in the next section. Yeah. Or we could have them as exceptions. That's right. It was really just a clean it up. But the more I teach it, the way it's written now, it yeah. makes it so much more clear because you can say two bullet points, general rule, bam, bam, create an electrically safe work condition unless you have one of these exceptions. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and people then, are getting it and they're understanding it. They're like, Oh, so we've been doing this wrong the whole time. And it's amazing how you didn't yes. change technically the requirements. You moved no. things to order them so that it's easier to understand. Yep. Something that drove me crazy when I was at NFPA and I watched you committee members. It was that. a short putt. And I was like, oh, this, they're just shifting stuff. Yeah. They're like, why are they doing it this way? And then now that I'm on. Yeah. Now that I'm a recovering NFBA member, <laughs> or not member, I'm still a member. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but no, I'm just kidding. That was a fantastic part of my career. I joke about it, but yeah. I, I tell that joke to my friends still on the inside. But um, but now that uh, now that I've moved on to the and next you're using, part of my, and you're trying and to I'm teach using it. it and teaching yeah. it and explaining it, I see the value in that now. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, my mom used to say, when I would say it drives me crazy, she'd say, it's a short putt. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a long drive. It's just a short, a short putt. putt. <laughs> and it took me a while to understand it, but she was wise and beyond her years. Awesome. Okay. So any any other big changes out of the the safety plan or the electrical safety program? you can think of i know when i look through here and what was highlighted there was one thing that was highlighted they added an emergency response plan yeah to the job safety, the plan. Job safety plan yeah so so that was twofold um i might have had a hand in that one as well Gosh, you um, just quit <laughs> hey i had one day from when i officially became a non-employee to the closing <laughs> you, you of, like of, of 70 public inputs so I, I pulled an all-nighter and I wrote as many public inputs as I could oh my to get them in. Um, <laughs> these were all things that have been bugging me. The, as a, the, you didn't experience. earn a Dan Leaf. Uh, no, okay. that wasn't that. It was only 12. It was only, it was only 12. 12. Okay. Yeah. And I think I think these are the only two that they actually did. Okay. Yeah. I've, I'm more ticked them off at the second draft stage but because uh, oh. I sided with some people. Uh, but anyways. Um, but the uh, so the emergency response plan is twofold. Number one, you're planning out a work that involves electrical hazards, and you are acknowledging that you're going to be working around them. So we need to know what's going to happen when things go south. Do we have an AED? Do we have a plan for right. pulling them out? The rescue plan if they get blown yeah. up. Do, what is the emergency response plan? Sure. Also. For instances where we use the justification that it's an additional hazard or increased risk mm -hmm. to do the work. So we've said shutting it off is so dangerous, other people are going to die yeah. or other people are going to get hurt or it's going to cause an environmental disaster, fill in the blank, well, the kind of stuff that we, we use that justification for. If we've got to that point and now we're doing energized work, we've just put ourselves at a higher risk of an unplanned shutdown because we've increased the likelihood yeah. of an arc flash or something like that yeah. happening. And so what's my plan to mitigate that additional hazard or increased risk if the stuff hits the fan? 
Yeah. So need to plan. great example, hospitals come in. They say, oh, we got people on life support devices right out of the offshore text. Yeah. You're going to do, uh, you're going to create an electrical, say, or you're going to do it energized. Sorry. Just, yeah. And uh, can't fight them on it because it's right there. Yeah. And then as you're doing your job safety plan, well, what are you going to do with those people if I drop my wrench? Now you have CCs down. Yeah. And the ICU is done. It's downstream from the transfer switch. Don't drop your wrench. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to, sir. I would love if I could promise you that, but I can't promise yeah. you that. So right. what's the backup plan? Right. And the funny thing is, is almost all those facility managers knew what that plan was because they drill it and they have it yeah. written down. And then when they yeah. give you that plan, they say, okay, we're going to take these group of people, move them to this side of the hospital. These yeah. people people will put over in this other hospital yeah. these ones are really bad so we're gonna have to put them in a helicopter get them to another level one trauma yeah. center and they they spew that off the time they know how much, they know the battery life of everything yep. that's on their equipment so they know how much time they have the whole bit right and then like a jerk i raise my hand and i say well could we do that first yeah because if we do that first then i can shut down this mcc i'm about to work on I don't run the risk of getting hurt. I don't run the risk of blowing up your MCC. Don't run the risk of causing you hundreds of yeah. thousands of dollars of repairs. Yes. Yeah. But it's going to cost you a little bit of money on the on the front end. Yeah. And that's when you start to get to people's real reasons for wanting to do energized repair work. A lot of times it's a financial thing. It's cheaper to do it energized. Mm-hmm. And you can, you can find that out when you get their backup plan. And that's why if they would have designed it differently to begin with, they could say, we're going to reroute power to that this way so this can be de-energized. It's as easy as one, two, three. I do a lot of work in the oil world, and a lot of that equipment is designed that way. The petrochem world has a lot of that functionality. Yeah, absolutely right. I was uh, So Shriver Air Force Base. You know, they have, they have uh, Shriver Air Force. When I first went to Shriver Air Force Base, I thought I was walking into, I'm, I'm thinking what jets are going to be there the whole bit. So Kevin Phillips was our guy um, that I always worked with. And Shriver Air Force Base was, didn't have any planes or jets. They were basically, they probably still are, the center where they would run operations that were happening overseas. So they have what they called pods. Mm-hmm. And they, each room was full of computers, okay? And they knew that if something happened in this pod, they had a complete duplicate pod set up. All they did was get up, walk across the hall, boom, sit down, and everything was right there, okay? If they needed to kill power to a pod or whatever, double-ended switch gear after double-ended switch gear, battery, uh, lead-acid batteries down in the basement, it was just amazing. But you could do anything you wanted in that facility. You could turn an, an entire area off, not interrupt processes at all. It's expensive, yeah. but it can be done. It can be done. And nowhere in OSHA does it say that you have to. It, is it, if it's expensive, you can leave the power on? That's uh, true. Yeah. No, you right. Yeah. Yeah. You either, yeah. That's a very good point. Very valid point. The Electrical Safety Program by Derek Fixtel and Tommy D. (laughs) It's now two o'clock in the morning and the candles have pretty much burnt out. I always like my candles, but it was overpowering today because they've been burning so long. But um, they were they were brand new when we started. Yeah, they were all brand new when we started. Yeah. So and um, that one's at the bottom. That one is, yeah, it burns faster. Must, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a different proprietary blend. The proprietary blend. Yeah. I love it. It's for her one account. This is a different account. That's two different accounts. We're di- that's actually, those are um, testing. What do they call that? Um, beta t- Prototypes. Prototypes. They're yes. prototypes for a, prototypes. New, a new product that yes. uh, Two Adorable Labs is uh, bringing to the market. So I'm going to put a plug in for Two Adorable Labs and her candles. The link will be down below because you could buy the candles online and anything else you could buy her cookbooks where she has her pepper stuffed peppers that uh derek and i had a little bite us and stuff so, derek thank you i appreciate you. well thanks for having me in your home again beautiful home i appreciate you having us out here for uh 
for this little chat and to celebrate National Electrical Safety Month in the month of May and Shock Leach. And uh, hopefully we can keep driving this message forward and get to a place where just give us one year nobody getting killed from electricity. Wow, that would be beautiful. But I'll tell you what, if that ever happens, it will be because E. Hazard, Eaton, and others all joined voices, forces to make sure that we communicated, built a culture of electrical safety. Doesn't take a lot. It just takes a change in culture and mindset. So we're on that journey. Let's go. Let's do it, brother. Brock Collard. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, and that's it for 110.3 safety. Electrical program. safety program. Electrical safety program. I always want to say plan. And that's it for 110.3B electrical safety. 110.3 electrical safety program. All right, before we do anything else, I'm going to shut this.